Our second scripture lesson today comes from the ninth chapter in the Gospel of Mark. Jesus and the disciples came to Capernaum, and when Jesus was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another, who was the greatest? He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he, looked at, he took a little child and put it among them. And taking the child in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. All thanks and praise be to God for his word, and may that be the inspiration and the guide and the hope of our lives, now and always. Amen. In a minute, I'm going to show you some pictures, but I want to preface that by saying these are pictures of people who in 1978 were part of the entering freshman class with me at Princeton Theological Seminary. These pictures are pictures of them now, not then, because we all were young and beautiful in those days. But I want to show you the first one and tell you who these people are. Jim Pinnell was, my, was Ruth and I, my best man at our wedding. Jim and my senior year live right next to me, and we were partners in crime. And Jim has been a lifelong buddy. We keep in touch even to this day. Jim became an associate minister in a big church in Cleveland and didn't like being a minister and went and became a portfolio manager. And that's what he is to this day. But we still keep in touch. Next picture. Uh, Alan Fisher is the minister of the Presbyterian Church in Fredericksburg, Virginia. He was my roommate my first year in seminary. And... Alan is a friend, but we got along much better after we stopped being roommates. <laughs> next. Hugh Matlack was a good friend, my next door neighbor, my second year in seminary, and he too was one of our, my partners in crime. In fact, he helped me. There, there was a broken down old car in the church parking, in, in the seminary parking lot where we parked, that took a valuable space. And nobody seemed to want to move it for months until Hugh and I got a crew together in the middle of the night and moved it and put it on the chapel steps at the seminary. <laughs> we got our parking space. Go ahead, next picture. Uh, Cindy Shepard uh, was part of our group. Cindy uh, went into ministry, served a, a number of churches in her career. Uh, she is by far what I consider to be the best preacher in our senior class. Cindy is now um, executive director of a, an environmental ministry in Champaign, Illinois. Alex Chamberlain was one of our good buddies. Alex is now the director of chaplaincy at a big hospital in Boise, Idaho. Alex was one of those ones amongst us. We always found trouble together. Alex is famous for having stolen the clapper out of the seminary bell and held it hostage for a while. Um, and now he's big and important and uh, a good friend. He was actually my wife's, my, not my wife, my daughter's boss at Boise uh, when my daughter was going through chaplaincy training. Paul Rack was Alex's roommate, and he was just as bad as the rest of us. Uh, Paul is a good friend. Paul went with us on our Palestine olive tree planting trip back in February 2014. So there's some in our congregation who knew and met Paul and his wife. Uh, Sue Westfall was part of our group, and uh, she became the pastor of a church, then she became a presbytery official, and now she is a, still serving in ministry, but it's a nonprofit ministry that helps ministers uh, uh, improve uh, their ministry and the communities of faith in which they work. Brian Blunt was one of my next-door neighbors in seminary. 
And I do have to say, I do believe, and I think, I think he did prove it also, Brian was the smartest student in my senior class. And uh, we played on the same intramural basketball team. And uh, Brian was a good friend, but we didn't really kind of hang out much because Brian was always studying which tells you what I was doing. <laughs> Bob Cathy was also in my, oh, by the way, Brian is now, go back to Brian, Brian is now the president of Union Theological Seminary in Richmond, Virginia. Um, the next guy is Bob Cathy. Bob was in my class. I didn't know Bob that well. We, we kind of knew each other. We, we weren't good, good friends. We didn't quite agree with each other on some things. Uh, Bob is now a very esteemed professor at McCormick Theological Seminary, and we still don't agree on some things. <laughs> and Craig Barnes, uh, Craig was a married student. Um, I knew him just kind of. Uh, you, you didn't get to know the married students that well, but, but Craig was a very good student. He was a very well-connected Presbyterian at Princeton Seminary. And that always yields something because now he is the president of Princeton Theological Seminary. And if you ask Craig who I was, he wouldn't know me from Adam. So these are some of the people that I went to, I entered seminary with. And, uh, you know, and like I said, some were uh, connected to the system very well. Others were brilliant as brilliant could be. Others were very activist with social issues, and others were kind of like me, the president of Princeton Seminary, when he said to a trustee one day, don't worry, uh, Bill, we will graduate the problem. He was talking about me. <laughs> um, and although we were friends and colleagues, went to seminary together, we were connected, we were a community together, I also have to say that we uh, often, in that environment, jockeyed for position against each other. We wanted to be good at what we did, and that meant sometimes we wanted to be better than the next person. You know, the, the one saying was, at Princeton Seminary was, we knew all the dark secrets of every student on campus except for one. We didn't know each other's grades. It was the best guarded secret because we were competing against each other. We didn't want anybody to know how well we were doing against the other. It could be very competitive. We would jockey for position. So the reason I showed you those pictures and talked about that is because that's exactly what we find in the Gospel of Mark today. Jesus is walking along on his mission trips with his disciples, and they're getting to Capernaum. And he knows human nature. Jesus knew the human condition. And so he asked his disciples, those 12 of them, he said, after they got to Capernaum, what were you doing along the way? And they knew what they were doing. And so they, they stopped, ex nay, ex nay, abort, abort, don't talk anymore, don't let Jesus know what we're doing because we were arguing about who the greatest is amongst us. But Jesus already knew. That's why he asked. And then he, then he hammered it home. Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Do we really know what that means? Do you really know what it means when Jesus says to you, we must be servant of all and last of all? Do any of us in this room know that? Do you know what that means? I would venture a guess and say, we don't. Can any of us say that we are intentionally and deliberately the last of all and the servant of all? Think about those words for a minute. You know, I, I think about that, and sometimes when I read that passage, he, we're saying last of all and servant of all, and we think, what's he, what's he doing? Is he, is he trying to lift up the socioeconomic class that is below them? Is he trying to say that the poorest are the best of all? Or what is, exactly is he saying when he says be last of all, servant of all? Let me tell you a story. Years ago, early 90s, I went on a mission trip to Barranquilla, Colombia, to work at the Presbyterian 
seminary there, we were reworking the campus and making it uh, a, a good envi learning environment for seminary students in Col for Presbyterian Columbia um, uh, seminary students. And um, I was the only one. There was about 15 of us on this trip from my church and others from the Presbytery. I was the only clergy on the trip. And so what happened was when they found out I was the clergy person in the group, um, someone who had a house church in the poorest barrio in Barranquilla wanted me to come on a Wednesday night and preach at their Wednesday night service because they found out I was the preacher, of course. And the president of the seminary also happened to be, at the time, she was interim president while they were looking for a new one, and she was a Presbyterian mission co-worker from the United States, and I had known her from other places. And she got in my ear right before we went to that service, and she says, now remember, these are the poorest of the poor. And they have no sense of what it means to be connected to Presbyterians or even Christians across the globe. You're, what you need to focus on in your mes message is how to c make them feel connected, that they're part of a bigger picture than just living in this barrio. And so I fashioned my sermon that way. But, it, but what I noticed was that this house was a little shack. And, and, and for a half hour before the service was to start, people were flocking in because the word had gotten out that there was a Presbyterian American minister who was going to preach the sermon. And so people were coming in because this was unusual and they wanted to see it and they were packing the place. The shack was packed full of people. They had to stand outside the shack and open the windows so they could hear me preaching. And the thing I noticed in the run-up to the service was that here were very, very poor people from Barranquilla, Colombia. And you know what they were doing before worship? They were all jockeying for position to try to get in the house and get as far front as they could. And I saw some pushing and shoving, and I saw some looks, and I saw some human jockeying, just like we do. Because you know what? That's the human condition. And it doesn't matter whether we're rich. It doesn't matter whether we're poor. The human condition is we jockey against each other. We try to get into a better position no matter who we are. So when Jesus says we need to be the servant of all and be the last of all, he doesn't he's not necessarily talking about socioeconomic condition. He's talking about attitude. He's talking about how we present ourselves to the world as children of God. And that involves everybody. In our assurance today, I read these words from 1 John. If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. I believe when Jesus tells us that we must be servant of all and we must be last of all, it means we understand what it means to be a people who seek to walk in the light of Jesus Christ above and beyond all else. And yet, when we read that from 1 John, that thing about light and not walking in darkness, there's, there seems to be an abstractness to that. It's hard to get a handle on exactly. We know what you're saying, John. We know walk in the light, don't walk in the darkness. But what does that mean day to day? What, is that, what are the nuts and bolts of walking in the light and not in the darkness. And that's why I always liked James. James took what others made sound abstract and gave it some specificity. And in today's lesson from James, he does exactly that. And I really believe James is giving us advice on how we walk in the light, the way that 1 John talks about it and others in the New Testament. James asks, begins by asking, who is wise and understanding among us? If you are, you will know how to do works that are done with gentleness and wisdom. And then he goes on to tell us what those nuts and bolts are. And I want to just 
mention those for a minute. He tells us to be this way. If we want to walk in the light, if we want to be people who are wise and understanding in this world according to how God teaches us to be, these are the ways we must be, James says. First thing he says is we must be pure. Well, what does pure mean? Well, pure most certainly means having hearts that value what God values. That's the very beginning of being pure. We have to understand what God values. We have to hear what God values. And then we have to have hearts that embrace that. That's the beginning of purity in this life, to embrace what God embraces as the values of life. But it's more than just the heart embracing it. It's the mind thinking it. And, and really to find purity in our lives means to bring the heart and the mind into sync with each other. And you know what you have when you bring heart and mind into sync according to the values of God? You've got a soul. You've got a soul, folks. That's what a soul is. The soul is the union of heart and mind dedicated to what God values the most. That's what God breathed into us. That ability, that, that living being that embraces the values of God in the way we live each and every day, the way we think it, the way we embrace it with our heart, that soul. That's what James is talking about when he says we must be pure. Our hearts and our minds must be unified. And we know that sometimes they go askew, they go different directions. Seeking to be pure is to bring them together in the ways that God is teaching us to do that. James goes on to say we must be peaceable and gentle. It means that we're willing to sacrifice all for being a peacemaker in life. Think about that for a minute willing to sacrifice all for being a peacemaker in life. And our example is clear. Jesus Christ went to the cross rather than fight it to be our prince of peace. And going right with that, he, James talks about a willingness to yield. You know when you're driving and you're in two lanes and the two lanes are going to merge into one? You know, there's, there's, a, there's, there's a place like that on Gladiolus as you're heading for Summerlin. There's that bridge thing and you've got to merge over to the left and then you take that bridge and you head on to Summerlin, and I always take that because that's where I go to get to the men's breakfast every Wednesday. So it's 6.30 in the morning. I'm tooling along, and it's busy as busy can be. It's rush hour traffic at 6.30 there. And I'm on Gladiolus. I've just crossed 41. And man, I tell you, people are jockeying for position like crazy because they're all wanting to go left to get on Summerlin. Most of them are heading to Health Park because they work at the hospital. And it gets crazy. And you're driving along, and sure enough, somebody zooms up from your right, and they're going to fit into that space that's only half a car length in front of you. And they don't care. And you know what? I don't want to yield. <laughs> I start stepping on the gas. You're not getting in that space. But I'm usually the one who lets up because I don't want to crash my Jeep. Willingness to yield, that's hard to do sometimes because you got to be peaceable and gentle. And I don't always feel like that behind the wheel, especially when someone's trying to take a space that belongs to me. <laughs> Full of mercy and good fruits. This is not just individual. I think this is for the whole church. You know, in a lot of ways, the history of the church has not been about grace, friends. The history of the church has been about rules. And if you, if you don't go by the rules, you're not in grace, and we're not going to show you mercy. 
and showing mercy are the good fruits of life. Early Christians discriminated, New Testament church Christians discriminated against Gentile Christians. Jesus never taught that. But they had rules that said you had to because you had to follow the Jewish laws. And pagans had to follow the Jewish laws too. They considered Gentiles pagans. So they had to follow the rules. And if you didn't follow the rules, you weren't worthy of mercy and grace. I once worked in a church when I was in seminary, had a balcony for slaves. And this is in New York, friends, not in the South. Okay? According to the rules, that's where the slaves sat. Was, that's about rules and not grace and mercy in the life of the church. Women once could not teach in the church. Women once in our church could not be elders. That's about rules. It's not about mercy and grace. And we know full well that this church, this denomination of ours, and this congregation has struggled mightily over questions of gay rights and same-gender marriage for years. And you know what? Fifty years from now, those issues will be the same kind of issues I just previously mentioned. The church will have gotten beyond it, and they will say, what was the deal? Why were we slaves to rules rather than grace? It's happening. It's going to happen. We may not be around when it does, but it will be the case, and the church will be a better place for it. And then finally, without trace of partiality or hypocrisy, you know, back when my son was in high school, Aaron, the church I was serving had youth elders for one year, and the chance was to give a youth a chance to have a leadership position in the church, but also kind of be a leader amongst the youth group. And the nominating committee chose my son, Aaron, to be a youth elder that year. And then the nominating committee presented the slate of new elders to the session for its, its approval before it went to the congregation. And there was an elder on the session who went ballistic about my son being a youth elder, although he was the one qualified that year, because he was the pastor's son. And that's showing partiality. And oh, of course, I, I wasn't in on the nominating committee meeting when they made that decision. But that's, that's, not, that's showing partiality. And, and the pastor is trying to create a voting block so he can have more control. Yeah, my son who, by the way, didn't say one word in a session meeting for that entire year. And here was the unfortunate part about it. He went ballistic, and I took it personally, and I went ballistic. So much so that elders who were on my side after the meeting came up to me and scolded me and said, you should trust us and keep your mouth shut. And they were right. My reaction, even though it wasn't true, my, my reaction showed to others who weren't in the know that maybe I was being really partial. And if I'd kept my mouth shut and let the elders who could handle it, handle it. No trace of partiality could have ever been seen. showing traces of partiality, even hypocrisy, comes when we, when we make everything personal, when it's all about us and not about those whom Christ calls us to serve. And finally, James says, if we do these things, we will find a harvest of righteousness that is sown in peace for those who make peace. I watched that press conference with Jimmy Carter when he announced to the world that he had melanoma. And this will probably be his swan song. Now, because he's so public a man, and we know there's going to be an ongoing forever debate in history about whether he was a good president or a bad president, and the debate will continue. I don't care to get into that. Um, but what is not in question is after his presidency, how he dedicated his life to peacemaking and made the Carter Center a force for that in the world. And so he was asked at the press conference if he had any regrets um, as president. 
his response was very, <laughs> very honest. He said, you know, if I had sent one helicopter, one more helicopter to that attempted hostage rescue in Iran, uh, we would have rescued them and I would have been reelected president. And then he stopped and thought about what he just said. And he said, but if I had the choice of a second term as president or founding the Carter Center, I would pick the Carter Center instead. Hmm. Genuine peacemaking. Genuine wisdom and understanding happens, really happens, when we stop jockeying for position. For that is when we have found the light rather than the limelight. Amen. Let us stand and say,